rained all night, but the sun is out, it's gorgeous fall day, welcome. Uh, today's handout has the text that we'll be looking at for the most part today. I think there should be enough for everybody, uh, pass those around. And also on the back side, and one of the things we will be talking about, and I hope we can get to it today, is how do we uh, deal with life when it doesn't, isn't turning out the way that we think? And I've been reading uh, <laughs> this book, which is a book worthy of your attention. It's called The Book of Joy. It's about conversations uh, between the Dalai Lama and Archbishop Desmond Tutu. If you can get this book in an audio version, it's really wonderful because you hear their own voices through much of it. So if you can check it out from the library in an audio version, Jan. It was several years ago that the Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu were here for a program called, not here, but in Seattle, for a program called Seeds of Hope. And I heard him speak at Ed Edmondson Pavilion. And they were, they were hysterical talking to each other. You know, they weren't holier than thou at all. They were like two young boys just having fun together. And yet talking about serious stuff. And right. they, they are in July. So I, I yeah, it really is. Yeah. They have a, have a great time with each other. They're full of laughter. John, there's a spot right for you, right there. Also, since I've been emphasizing that the heart of the Sermon on the Mount is forgiveness, these two books, Forgive and Forget and The Art of Forgiving, are both by Professor at Fuller Seminary, former press professor. Unfortunately, he died in uh, 2002. Lewis Smith, my favorite professor. Um, I'd be happy to loan these to you if one of you wants to take them home. Just be sure to get them back. I'm not going to, after next Sunday, I won't be here every Sunday, but if you bring it back, you can put it in Jennifer's box and put a note on it, because I see her every week at Bell Practice. So anyway, two books. I think they're both available on Amazon, The Art of Forgiving and Forgive and Forget. Excellent books about forgiveness. So, uh, let's jump in. I'm going to do a little review. I know that Mike and Peggy watched the video of last week's session, and Mike has a question that he's going to uh, raise up. And apparently, John's doing this great work of taping these, and so they are available on the website. Is that correct? Well, that's correct. We uh, missed last week, and uh, you know we've been able to see all the rest. And uh, so we got on the website and saw the video and it was just like being here. We got all the jokes and... That's the most important part. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but it, I, I had a question um, regarding the, the definition of adultery. So in the Bible, and I just use the worst example of King David and Bathsheba, you know, then he's accused of adultery and Nathan calls him out. So, um, but David, and famously all the rest of the kings and so on, have these harems and, and so on, concubines and so on, and nothing is ever said about that. So is, what is really adultery? And my, we were talking about this, and Peggy and I, and uh, it seems like the peop, some of the rich and famous people today seem to have the same kind of situation. <laughs> <laughs> so, so is adultery... David is accused of adultery because he, uh, you know, expropriated Bathsheba from her, her husband Uriah. Is that is that the definition <coughs> that Jesus is talking about? Yeah, we won't. Let's not. We won't worry about adultery today. Let's okay, just <laughs> the Bible. In the Bible, uh, adultery <coughs> is. Uh, having sexual intercourse with someone who's not your spouse, especially if the woman, if you're a man, and the woman you're having uh, sex with is also married. So it's breaking a bond of marriage through uh, a sexual relationship. Um, it is true that in the Old Testament, uh, multiple marriages or concubines was a part of the culture, was accepted without moral condemnation at the time. Generally speaking, though, uh, the Hebrew tradition, the Jewish tradition, and of course this influenced the Christian tradition is that marriage was just with a single single partner. And so any any breaking of that sexually outside the bonds of marriage is what the Bible considers adultery. Fornication enters in, but fornication is usually typified as the same act but with an unmarried person. 
So now follow on to that. <laughs> I think you made, you made a really good point about the impact of divorce on the, the woman who was tantamount to kind of almost a death sentence because they are destitute and so on. Essentially abandoned, yes. Right. But what about the rights of inheritance for their children? Were the children still viable in, after the divorce? I mean, who... Did, uh, today we have these laws that sort of protect people during the divorce, but in biblical times, what happened to the children of that marriage when there was a, a separation? Inheritance was generally through uh, the male, the son, uh, usually the eldest son, that was the pattern. Sometimes different situations arose that that didn't happen. It would stay in the clan, though. Even if there wasn't a son, it would stay in the, that clan so that it would go on to a brother uh, and so forth. Uh, so inherit, inheritance, and that's why it was particularly difficult for women who were not in that, they weren't going to inherit, yeah. generally speaking. There's always exceptions to every rule, but generally speaking, that was, that was the pattern. Okay, well we talked about some really interesting things last week. We talked about all of that. We, talked, we, we began by talking about uh, Jesus says after the Beatitudes, I keep repeating this, but it's important that you are the salt of the earth, and he says you are the light of the world. You being you, disciples. And that means, as I've been saying, that to follow the Sermon on the Mount or is to be salty, luminous disciples. That's what it really is to belong to the kingdom of heaven and to follow Jesus. We did talk about lust. Jesus says lust leads to adultery, which leads to divorce. And he says if you're if you uh, desire someone with your eye, you've already committed adultery in your heart, cut out your eye, tear it away so you won't enter uh, in, into hell. And I said emphatically, that is not to be taken literally, but it is to be taken seriously. Because what we see, and I think we're gonna focus on this more next week, what we see, what we let into ourselves by <laughs> focusing on is really the first step in what we do and how we behave. And so our focus, what we give our most attention is very, very important. We talked about divorce. We re-emphasized <coughs> some of that here with uh, Mike's question this morning. I mentioned my Valentine's Day card that Barry gave to me long ago, you know, the one that said on the outside, hubby, you're so easy to love, and on the inside it said, uh, difficult to live with sometimes, but easy to love. <laughs> That difficult to live with but easy to love, that really is a dynamic of marriage, of all marriages, even of relationships. Relationships are loving, they're also difficult at times. And so that balance and back and forth is an important thing uh, to keep in mind. So we concluded last week talking about not judging. Jesus says, do not judge so that you may not be judged. Part of what he's talking about, to judge ultimately, another person ultimately, is to take away God's role. Only God can judge ultimately, because God is the only one who can see the true heart. And also the difficulty with judging is that we are often judging the very things that we do. And so the issue of judging can easily fall over into hypocrisy. And I also mentioned last week that um, well, and I'll just mention again that Jesus uses that comic image of take uh, uh, the log out of your own eye or the beam out of your own eye before you worry about the little splinter that's in uh, the other person's eye. And I quoted uh, from Dale Bruner's commentary on Matthew. He uses it, he expresses it this way. Uh, doing that is like being a log-eyed reformer trying to save a speck-eyed sinner a redwood teaching a shrub to be low profile. So that's, that's a very apt image for us to remember about the not judging. And of course, I guess this is probably true of any kind of grouping, but the church can be kind of a hotbed of judgment, and often it's very petty, it's she seems so snobby to me, or he didn't pay enough attention to me, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so we have to be especially on the guard of uh, judging others and the hypocrisy entailed with that in the life of the church. 
Okay, that's a quick review. Any other questions about last week? Anything you want to follow up with? Okay, let's jump ahead. Uh, we're going to look into the center of the Sermon on the Mount. And if you have that diagram that has been on some of the other handouts with you, you see that in the very center, there are the three items of praxis, Christian praxis, what it means to be faithfully Christian. Almsgiving, prayer, and fasting. And we're going to focus on uh, prayer this morning. I ask, I've asked you each week if you want me to discuss things, uh, send questions to me. And I got two from two people uh, this past week, Nancy Gale sent me some questions, and Leanne Neko sent me some more, where that's what we're going to focus on today. So here's what Nancy raised. She wrote, Matthew chapter 6, verse 6, is often quoted as informing contemplative prayer practices like centering prayer. So I think it's on your handout, Matthew 6, 6. But wherever you go, pray. Wherever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. And then Nancy paired that with Psalm 46.10 in her question. Psalm 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. And so Nancy's question was, this seems to call us to be with God in stillness and silence. At the same time, it seems much of our community worship excludes silence. How does the Sermon on the Mount and the passages on prayer inform, guide us in our prayer life, both in silence and vocal prayers? So let's read what Jesus specifically says about this. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners so they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, Go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. When you are praying, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask. So I want to begin with Nancy's comment that much of our community worship excludes silence. No kidding. Uh, when we were at the church in Birmingham, Michigan, First Presbyterian Church in Birmingham, Michigan, my wife Mary's best friend was a woman named Mary. And she had been divorced, and during our time there, she married a man named Rick. Good seat for you right there, Bill, or you over I'll hide over here so nobody right. notices. It's on the video. It's on the video. Yeah, forever recorded on the video. So. Okay, back to Birmingham, Michigan, First Presbyterian Church. My wife Mary's best friend there was a woman named Mary. She was divorced when we went there, but during our time there, she married a, a wonderful man named Rick. And Rick was a friend, capital F friend. That is, he was a Quaker who belonged to the Society of Friends. And of course, the Quakers have a, a strong tradition in their worship with the practice of guided silence. It's not always completely silent, and <laughs> during a service, uh, sometimes a person will feel the need to speak out, uh, but it's a lot of silence, minutes and minutes, long stretches, perhaps even a whole service, basically, of silence. In fact, Rick's and Mary's wedding was a Quaker wedding, and it was mostly silence. Mm -hmm which was very, very awkward for all us Presbyterians. <laughs> <laughs> so Mary was a member of First Presbyterian Church, and she and Rick sometimes attended there. In fact, I baptized one of their uh, children, a uh, young child, after the child was born. And then other times they went to Rick's Quaker Fellowship. And I still remember, we had dinner with them after I received a call was to the church that we served them afterwards in Spokane. But before we left, we had dinner with them to kind of say goodbye. He encouraged me 
in my new church to make sure there was always more silence in worship. And here's what he said. You know, Bill, Presbyterian worship is very, very noisy. <laughs> I still remember that. I also have to confess that in the 30 years of my ministry following his admonishment to me, I probably failed at that time and time and time. Again, our worship is pretty noisy. And you can tell in a long stretch of silence in a worship service, you can feel people get uneasy especially if you're up leading a part of the service. You can just feel the unease in that, in that silence. Well, Jesus says, don't stand out in front of others. Don't pray in public so you can be seen by others. In other words, go into your room. And what's interesting, that word that's just translated as room in the New Testament that we have is actually a supply closet. That's what it's about. And in a poor Palestinian home of that time, the supply closet where you would keep things, feed for your animals, uh, cleaning things and so forth, the supply closet was the only room in a typical poor home that could be locked. And so the idea is to go where no one else is and you can not only be by yourself, but you can lock the door. You can lock yourself in from the outside. And that's where you pray. And you pray to your Father in secret, and the Father, our Heavenly Father, who sees us in secret, will reward us. Wow. That's probably not something I'll comment later about our prayer life. That's where prayer starts. That's where we enter into the presence of God. And now think of it. Here's the most ordinary room, most unholy room you would think in your home, that then becomes that sacred space where one encounters God. And God will reward us. And what's the reward? The reward is that God is there. That God is present. The ruler of the universe is present with us. We don't have to do anything to make God be present. All we have to do is go into our, our room, whatever that might be. And if we want to grow in prayer, and I know there have been classes in the, the adult Christian education program here about prayer and such, probably would be time sometime to have another one about that. It is so important. It is the heart of, of everything. And we don't have to beg God to be there. Back in the time when the New Testament was, was written, there was a Roman philosopher named Seneca. And he said that to get the attention of the divine, you had to fatigue the gods. Another writer during that time said, let each one wear himself out with his petitions to the gods. Religious, pagan religious practice tended to suggest that you had to get God's attention, the God's attention to come and prove yourself that you were worthy of their paying attention to you. The prayer, the person, had to prove worthy of God's attention. And I'm sure you remember the story about Elisha, and I printed it in your handout today, when Elijah confronted the priest at Baal. It's such an interesting little thing, I want to just read the verses from 1 Kings chapter 18. Remember, there was a contest to prove whose God was God. They were going to have a contest which God would burn up the sacrifice on the altar. So, verse 26, so they took the bull that was given them, prepared it, and called on the name of Baal from morning until noon, crying, oh, Baal, answer us. But there was no voice and no answer. They lived about the altar that they had made. At noon, Elijah mocked them, saying, cry loud, surely he is a god. Either he is meditating, some translations actually, it's a Hebrew word that's very obscure, but it could mean sitting on the toilet, so. <laughs> <laughs> so he is either 
meditating, whatever, or he has wandered away, or he's on a journey, or perhaps he is asleep and must be awakened. Then they cried aloud, and as was their custom, they cut themselves with swords and lances until the blood gushed out over them, seeing, proving that you are so devoted that you will injure yourself so that the God will pay attention to you. As midday passed, they raved on until the time of the offering of the oblation, but there was no voice, no answer, and no response. We don't have to do that. And Bruner says this kind of belief Says, Bruno says, it de deifies God by making God a grudging giver and turning us into de dehumanized persons. There's nothing we need to do to get God's attention. There's nothing we need to do to deserve God's time. We just need to pray. And the discipline of the locked room is a place where we learn prayer. And prayer for Jesus was not just a sense of prayer, it was talking to God with words. Prayer is a conversation. It is an attempt to use words. Now it's true that some of our words are that in prayer, if we're truly being honest and coming to God's presence, we probably feel like we're stammering, but remember what Paul said in the book of Romans, he said, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought. But that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. So the stammering, yes, crying out, we don't know what to pray, even saying to God, I don't know what to pray, I don't know how to pray, God help me. That's all a part of our speaking to God. Now, having said all that, we might come away with the idea that Jesus doesn't want us to pray in public. That can be a takeaway from this. Prayer is just for the, the locked room. That's not true because Jesus speaks many times about praying together. And of course the prayer that he teaches right at the center of the Sermon on the Mount is the Lord's Prayer. And it's a communal prayer. It's our Father in heaven. Hallowed be your name. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and do not bring us to the time of trial but rescue us from uh, the evil one. So a uh, theologian in the 11th century named Theolac, he said, should I not pray in church? Indeed I should, but with a right mind and not for show, for it is not the place for it is not the place which harms prayer, but the manner and the intent with which we pray. <coughs> so prayer begins, we learn prayer in the secret closet. And then as we grow in prayer, in that ability to have conversation with the God who is a gracious giver and wants us to be present with him, then we also pray in public. So, Prayer is a huge subject. The discipline is hard. Gentlemen, we need to confess that it's often harder for us, us men. It seems to be my experience in the ministry that men seem to have a more difficult time uh, with prayer. But if we're going to be salty, luminous disciples, we need to pray. And our Father who sees in secret will reward us. Reward us by paying attention to us and listening and being present. So, Nancy, that's a little bit of an answer to your question about, uh, about prayer that's taught in the Sermon on the Mount. Any questions or responses? Yeah, in response to the silence part of it, uh, I really appreciate during the Lord's Prayer that we're kind of doing that communally as, as an organization, like as a group, like you say, a congregation. Uh, during communion, uh, I kind of yearn for a silence time because for me, communion is kind of a me and God connecting more than a corporate experience. And, and when we're singing as a congregation during communion, to me that sort of provides a disconnect from that. Just my personal yeah. experience. Other yeah. <coughs> reactions, comments? Yes? It seems to me that there's almost two parts. There's the public side and then the private side. And we are responsible for maintaining that private side. 
Right, I think that's a good way of putting it. And it's also where we learn prayer, where we learn what it means to be in um, direct conversational contact with our creator, right? the God who loves us. And then the uh, public prayer, I think, has a greater depth to it as well. Yeah, Chip? Just a, <clears throat> a little aside, when I mentioned in those times they had doors that locked both on the inside and the outside. Doors that locked on the inside and the outside. That was the door, the one door in the place that would be locked. <laughs> but if the stance would be locked from the outside, keep people from getting in the inside. Actually, the commentary I read didn't tell me the answer to that. <laughs> I guess it would have to be, be able to be locked on both sides. Okay, good, good question. Yes? Well, I was just wondering if you talk about prayer, where is the idea of kneeling? I mean, when I was a kid, we always knelt at the side of the bed at night to say our prayers. What, how does that kneeling fit into all this? You know, it's interesting. The Jewish custom of prayer was to stand when one prayed. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's why he talked about standing in public out on the street. Uh, it was interesting. Uh, the one time I visited Israel, we took a plane uh, 747 from New York City to uh, Tel Aviv, where we landed. And I was at a section. Uh, between sections, you know, the 747s are so big they have different sections, and there was the galley there, and there was space kind of to the side. And <laughs> on that trip, uh, probably some hundreds of Jews going to uh, the Jewish homeland, and a lot of Orthodox men Jews. And so during the flight, about 10 hours, they would stand to pray. And they would go to that little uh, area there that was open. And the Orthodox will often pray, you will, if you watch them, if they get nodding like this while they're praying. And it's, they do that, to me that would be very disruptive, but it's a rhythm that they get going in to then cut out the around them. But they stood to pray. Now, I prayed in my seat, especially when the plane got a little rough. But, uh, <laughs> so the pattern is was to stand. I honestly don't know uh, where kneeling came in. Kneeling for us, well, in many traditions, it's a sign of, of humility before one's greater in human terms or in divine terms, too. So I suppose that may have something to do with it. But I don't know where the tradition uh, started. Uh, which is a good way of saying you don't need to nail to pray. You can stand. You can do what's comfortable for you. Uh, one of the books that uh, I have used constantly in prayer uh, about prayer is get comfortable. If you're going to have a conversation with a good friend, you get comfortable. God is a good friend, so be comfortable. Not so comfortable that you go to sleep, but you know. <laughs> Okay, any other questions? All right, let's jump ahead. I mentioned that I had the uh, email from Nancy. I also had one from Leanne. And she asked two questions. And the first was this, the comment on what is righteousness? We read about that in chapter 5. And what does it look like in chapter 5, verse 6, and chapter 5, verse 20? So Matthew 5, verse 6 says this. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Now the biggest problem with understanding what Jesus meant by righteousness is that we confuse it with being morally pure or morally upright. It's, in other words, it's a condition that we have or that we can attain to. And that's the typical Roman Catholic interpretation of righteousness that it is behavior according to God's will. It's the whole of virtue, as one ancient uh, philosopher and theologian said. It's something that we can attain. It's virtue that we can exhibit and, and obtain. Protestant teaching tends to emphasize it a little differently, mm -hmm. that it's not our own virtue, it's what God gives to us when we are forgiven. But it's really important to note this. Matthew does not say, blessed, are the righteous, but blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. It's something that we long for. It comes from a hunger and a need. 
and a thirst that we have inside of us. It's a longing to be related to God. And it's a trusting that as we long and go through the habits and disciplines of relating to God, it's trusting that God wants to be related to us. So righteousness isn't obtainable. It's something that we are always seeking, always going towards, always a goal that lies ahead. And so that's why the other verse that uh, Leanne mentioned comes into play here. In Matthew 5, verse 20, Jesus says, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. If we're thinking of righteousness as something that we possess, then we have to have more of it than the other people, the scribes or Pharisees or anyone else. But that's not the right way to read what Jesus is saying. We don't have more righteousness as some kind of quantity about ourselves, because Jesus doesn't talk quantitatively. He's talking qualitatively. We are seeking a different kind of righteousness. We are called to seek the ever merciful, forgiving, and reconciling will of God. Okay, I'm going to read a little 75 cent theology for you here. Some big words. Karl Barth is my favorite theologian. He's probably the preeminent theologian of the 20th century. His systematic theology is 13 volumes, 8,000 pages. <laughs> I'm kind of reading my way through. It'll take about six years. But uh, <laughs> I'm in the third volume right now. He's talking about uh, what it means to trust in God's righteousness. So let me read this very convoluted sentence, and then I'll try to explain it. For according to the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments, what constitutes the demonstration and exercise of God's righteousness, what makes penitence and obedience necessary on man's side, very patriarchal in his writing, is precisely the fact that God enters into covenant with man and promises that his sins are to be forgiven and eternal life assured. So let me try to unwrap what that means. Bart is saying that God's righteousness, the holiness, the goodness, the love of God, God's righteousness is demonstrated when we, in penitence and obedience, that's Bart's way of saying hungering and thirsting for righteousness, when we trust that God loves us and has covenanted with us, that is, God has promised to be with us now and in eternity. And so God has made that promise. That's his righteousness. And when we trust that, when we hunger and thirst and seek that, we enter into that and are promised then that God will be with us now and in eternity. So hungering and thirsting for righteousness is trusting God. And so to exceed in righteousness isn't a possession that we receive or can get. It's a way. It's a path. It's a discipline. It's a journey. It's what our lives are all about. So I think that's what is going on. Where's Leanne? There she is. I think that's what's going on there in, in Jesus talking about righteousness. Any reactions, comments, questions? Yes. Yes, I have a, a thought about that, um, that there are some things that we cannot know. And that might be what righteousness is. We don't know for sure. God only knows that, just the same as truth. And that uh, thought that has been expressed by a number of people, I think, um, most recently in my life by Tony Copes and Trish Rogers that God grant me the company of those who seek the truth and deliver me from those who claim to have found it. <laughs> <laughs> I think Carl Bart would approve of that statement. <laughs> righteousness. Right. Deliver me from those who think they are righteous. Well, that, that's right, and it goes back to what we were saying earlier, that it's uh, prayer is 
about not what we can attain to, it's what we're longing for. And righteousness is the same way. These are, these are what we're called to do. We're on a journey. That's what it means to be a disciple. We're followers, and we can't claim it for ourselves. We give glory to God. Yes. And today, I'm going to be celebrating the 90th birthday of a friend whose email address is Seeker. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. Seeker. All right, yes. great. I like that. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, reactions about righteousness? Yes, John. Well, it occurs to me that most of my use of righteous mm -hmm. comes with mm -hmm. self-righteous. Mm -hmm. And appar <laughs> apparently, we mm -hmm. don't want to be righteous. So I think I, I appreciate this conversation about what Jesus is saying about righteousness and how it might impinge on our lives. I think that the way you raise that is really important. If we're following the, the theology of what Jesus is teaching here, we cannot be self-righteous. We can act self-righteous, but righteousness doesn't exist in us. It comes from God. And that's why we're hungry for it and thirsting for it because it's what our true destiny is. But it isn't something that we can conjure up from ourselves. So if one comes across self-righteously, it's a little bit like what Lynn was saying, that it's a sense of... Uh, you know, I know the truth, and I'm right, and you're wrong, kind of thing. <laughs> okay, I know our music folks have to leave here in a second. All right, we're going to go on to the next one of Leanne's questions. Uh, she asked about uh, this. She said, how do we reconcile Matthew 6? verses 25 through 34, with people suffering war, oppression, and natural disasters, disease, etc., when your Heavenly Father knows what you need. Let's uh, read those verses. Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed, clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, what will we eat? Or what will we drink? Or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things, and indeed your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's <coughs> trouble is enough for today. So the question is, is this just really on the one hand, on the other hand kind of passage? Is it a yes but way of looking at things? And it seems to be saying that disciples should seek first the kingdom of God, and then all these things will, will be supplied. Or, as I read in one commentary, a more crass way of putting it would be, those who take care of God's business will be taken care of by God. So, is this a don't worry and be happy kind of thing? Well, a lot of people down through the centuries have found this very problematic. I mean, face it, how can we not seek food and drink and clothing? All those things are necessary for our existence. Is this not a religious flight from solid reality, one person asked? How can we depend on God to provide in a world where evil is all too often the triumphant thing? 
how can we see God's hand in nature that is red and tooth and claw? All of nature depends on eating some other part of nature. That goes basically from the, just the above the atomic level all the way up. Even the stars get their energy by, it's just red and tooth and claw. How can one see God, uh, how could anyone take no thought for tomorrow? Would that not result in disaster? And finally, does this passage not encourage people to belittle or abandon work? Imagine if you just said, okay, I don't have to worry about anything God will provide. Call your boss if you're still working. <laughs> not coming in today, God's going to provide. <laughs> ah. So those are the kinds of issues that Leanne's question uh, is getting at. How can we reconcile what Jesus says with the way life seems to be? Well, one way to respond is to affirm faith and hope. For example, in Psalm 46. Nancy alluded to that in her question, but I printed out for you the whole of Psalm 46. We can affirm this sort of thing. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with its tumult. There's a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of the city. It shall not be moved. Of course, it's speaking about Jerusalem. God will help it when the morning dawns. Of course, Jerusalem was torn apart by the Romans, of course. Uh, the nations are in uproar. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord. See what desolations he has wrought on the earth. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. A lot of war still going on. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I am exalted among the nations. I am exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Those are powerful words. They affirm what we need to often affirm in faith, but the issue is Psalm 46 wasn't written when all those bad things were happening. It was written at a time after bad things had happened, and the psalmist is affirming that despite the bad things, we can trust God, that the Lord of hosts is with us. And the question becomes very existential for us. Can we really trust God? And we all face this in one degree or another when suffering comes upon us or when we are just overwhelmed by the suffering of the world. Psalm 46 is nice. Jesus' words about birds and lilies are lovely. But are they enough? Here's what one commentator said. Sure, birds and lilies don't worry about life, but they also don't have mortgages, car payments, grocery bills, and college tuitions to keep them awake at night. All of us would like to be relieved of worry and anxiety, but Jesus appears to be suggesting an unrealistic strategy. Look at the birds, look at the lilies, to which one is tempted to reply, yes, but look at the bills. What do we do with this? I'll tell you a story that was told uh, to me by one of the professors at Fuller Seminary when I was uh, attended there back in the um, early 70s. Fuller is in Pasadena, and to get to Pasadena and to live in Southern California, you, you encounter the Southern California freeways. I mean, I-5 and 405 and I-90 can be really nasty, but not like the freeways in California. It's, it's crazy. Um, and, uh, and after three years, I felt like I could go out on the freeway uh, without risking my life every time, but it's still, it's, it's dangerous on the freeways. So one of the professors shared a story, I think an apocryphal story, but one that I think makes a point. He said, there was a very faithful Christian man. Every day his commute uh, was about an hour and a half 
on the Los Angeles freeways from his home to his work and then from work to return home. So after arriving at work in the morning or arriving at home in the evening, he would stop and take a moment by himself to give prayers of thanksgiving to God for his safety while he was commuting. Then one day on his commute, commute home in this case, he was in an accident on the freeways. And he was injured, but not very seriously. And he was, uh, had to go to the hospital, but he was released the same day, and he had some bruises and some cuts, and uh, he had to wear a brace on one of his legs for a while. But when he got home from the hospital, and even while he was in the hospital, he thanked God for protecting him, that he was not more seriously injured. And then some time later, some years I think later, he was on the commute, and he was in a bad accident, and he was killed. And a week or so later, at his church, his family and his friends and his church relations gathered together in the sanctuary. They praised God for this life of faith that was lived so well and so inspiringly to many others. And the professor then asked us, well, where was God in all these three experiences? And we were, this was our senior year, so we were supposed to know all the answers. <laughs> <laughs> and we, uh, we all thought about it, and I, somebody tried to give an answer, and he said, well, that's, that's okay, your answer's all right. But the real theological, biblical truth is that God was there all the time. God was in every situation. And giving thanks in every situation was appropriate and what we as Christian faithful people are to do. Life isn't safe. If we take what Jesus says in this passage that we read as we're always going to be safe, then we're not talking about the real world. We're talking about Disneyland where all the rides and everything that happens in there is pre-programmed pre and made safe and no harm can come. And that's not true about life. What we can trust in Christian faith is that God is with us in all the particulars of life. All the moments that we experience on the Los Angeles freeways or whatever the similar situation might be uh, for our life. And I think that's the only answer that we can come. What it comes down to is what the Sermon is on the Mount is trying to teach again and again and again. Do we trust God? Do we trust God at the very core of our lives with everything that happens to us? This does not mean that we won't cry out in pain, we won't be agonized, we won't have suffering in our lives. There's uh, terrible suffering that sometimes we endure or people that we know endure, and of course we see the suffering uh, in the world. Uh, last week, or maybe it was the week before, Mary got a, a text from uh, a man named we, a friend. He, we call him Pastor Efrain. He's a pastor in Nicaragua, and Mary got to know him uh, when one of our mission teams from my church in Sudbury went to uh, work there for 10 days in Nicaragua. Pastor Efrain works in the most poor, difficult area of Nicaragua. He <coughs> basically, he has no resources and he's working and helping people who have even less. And we have financially helped him um, out from time to time. But the last time we did, we said, we're retired now and we don't have the resources, financial resources that we did, we're not sure that we uh, can give. Well, he texted Mary and said, I'm desperate. I don't have food for my family, let alone helping his parishioners. So Mary and I, we talked, and uh, I said, well, we said we couldn't, but I think God's telling us now we have to. So, you know, we took some money out of our savings and we wired it to him. We, we know he got through, got the money, and uh, 
it, it helped out. Um, it doesn't solve his need, but it helped at the time. And while it hurt us a little bit, the little bit it hurt is so small compared to the need that he has. And that's, that's what we do as Christian people. We, we do what we can in the circumstances we face, but life is difficult, life is painful, and sometimes it's just very, very, very hard. Um, and I think the Sermon on the Mount as a whole is not a don't worry, be happy kind of thing. It's about trust God. Trust God in all aspects of life. So, some weeks we've ended on a happy joke. I don't have one this week. But we have a few minutes if there's uh, for some further discussion. experiences to the third world, Haiti in our case, uh, we share a worship service with them. We come to their worship service, uh, have an interpreter so we kind of know what's going on. Uh, but to see people in that desperate situation, very analogous to the Nicaragua situation, uh, living on, on dirt floors and, and just barely making it from meal to meal. Uh, and the faith and the confidence and the joy that they experience uh, and that they demonstrate in worship uh, is very humbling. Uh, knowing that we're there for a couple of weeks, you know, we can be joyful because we're gonna go back to, to where abundance exists in our lives. And it's just a real struggle to, to get inside their heads and feel how they can feel God's counsel and comfort and trust in God when their future is pretty much where they are. Probably not going to change a whole lot. Well, that's right. And the kind of story that I, the, even the Los Angeles Freeway story, let alone the past refrain story, it, for us, it, this is a first world problem. We, we live with the kind of abundance that uh, the rest, much of the rest of the world doesn't have. They have their own struggles. When we see what they go through, it is, like you said, it's humbling for us. It also is a call to us to do what we can. Uh, the best we can. But in both cases, life is not necessarily safe. It's not safe. And if we want it to be safe, then we're, we're, we're after, we're, we're pursuing the wrong goal. We're not pursuing the righteousness of God if we want it to be safe and not harm our bank account or whatever. We have to be faithful. We have to hunger and thirst over this righteousness. We've got to go into prayer with God and ask God all these questions. You know, if you want to go into your your room, lock the door uh, from the inside, as you pointed out, <laughs> whatever. And if you want to yell at God, if you even want to curse God, the Bible's full of those examples. Be honest with God with all your hurts and feelings. That, and we grow from that, but it's not, it's not a easy, happy, happy thing. Any other thoughts, questions? Yes? I think um, that when we believe that God is with us and we're, we ask him for guidance, I think that if that we are able to go ahead and to be open to, to input and um, so we can listen to whatever voice or whatever way God voices and instructions to us usually through the through the Holy Spirit, I believe, mm -hmm. and and we're guided. And um, I'm thinking of um, I'm thinking of a story that I that I heard when I was at the, when I was in the hospital doing chaplaincy, and it was a, a young man who said who was in the burn unit, 
a place I was really uncomfortable going into a lot of times, but he was anyway. And um, he said, um, this was told, oh, it wasn't me, it was the sister who was there. And he said, sister, do you believe in that God speaks to you? And she said, oh, yes. And he said, well, he said he was on his way to meet some friends at the beach. And he heard a voice in his head that said, turn back, which he ignored. And then he heard it again, turn back, and he ignored it. And then he said, turn back the third time, and he still ignored the voice. And he went to the beach, and <coughs> they were having a campfire, and they got drunk. And he rolled into the campfire with, he had on like a, an island park or something like that. So he got quite badly burned. But to me, that says God speaks to us in different ways. Sometimes it's just a feeling, oh, I shouldn't be doing this today or, or whatever. And, and if we're not tuned in, sometimes we, have, we don't hear the, the message, which is avoid or take back or do something different or whatever, or go to the doctor. Right. You know? It is about tuning in, about focusing, and, and, and we do that on our own. We do need to go to that room, whatever it is for us, but we also do it corporately. We do it together. That's why the community of faith is so important. We are stronger together than we are by ourselves. So the Sermon on the Mount doesn't, isn't about just being an individualistic believer. It's about growing in faith as a community. That's why I've said it. And I'll keep saying it all the way through the class. The heart of the sermon is our Father who art in heaven. And then from that comes the need to forgive as we have been uh, forgiven. Okay, well, thank you. We need to stop, but uh, next week.